Today we're going to be looking at another video by Veritasium. Specifically, we're going to be looking at this video right here called Why Einstein Thought Nuclear Weapons Were Impossible. This reminds me, I believe it was Arthur C. Clarke that said if an elderly but distinguished scientist said something is possible, it often is, but if an elderly but distinguished scientist says something is impossible, he's probably wrong, or something to that effect. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check it out. Now that we have nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants, you might think that it was always inevitable that we would be able to harness the energy inside the nucleus of atoms. But that was far from the case. In fact, serious scientists thought the idea was laughable, like Nobel laureate Robert Millikan, who in 1928 said, there is no likelihood man can ever tap the power of the atom. The glib supposition of utilizing atomic energy when our coal has run out is a completely unscientific utopian dream. That is fascinating. In 1928, not that far away, 17 years away from 1945, the development of the first uh, nuclear weapons. and. And in 1951, EBR-1 being the first reactor to produce electricity that's used by the grid. Crazy. And this isn't the only case. Um, Lord Kelvin in 1895 said heavier than air flying machines were impossible eight years before the Wright brothers flew their plane. It's always impossible until it's done, right? Very inspirational. Or as Rutherford put it, anyone who expects a source of power from the transformation of these atoms is talking moonshine. Now there was good reason for their pessimism. When Becquerel first observed radioactivity, he thought it was a phenomenon similar to phosphorescence. That's when you shine radiation like light onto an object and it absorbs that energy and later re-radiates it in a different part of the spectrum. Now uranium ore sure. was known to do this as I witnessed firsthand. Oh yeah, heck yes, fluorescent uranium ore. That's a fun color. So yes, it doesn't glow green, it glows purple. <laughs> <laughs> it depends what you shine it with, but that's a fun picture of uranium ore. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Here it's absorbing UV light and re-radiating it as visible light. In 1896, Becquerel performed experiments where he placed uranium ore in the sunshine on top of some wrapped up photographic film. Now he found that the film was exposed, seemingly by invisible rays from the uranium ore that penetrated the paper when the uranium was excited by the sunlight. But one day when he went to do his experiment, the weather in Paris was lousy, so he put the uranium and the photographic film inside a drawer. And a few mm. days later, even though the uranium hadn't seen the sun, he decided to develop the film anyway. And what he found was that the photographic film had been exposed just as before, even though the uranium was not excited by sunlight. So this was not a phosphorescence phenomenon. Some type of radiation and therefore energy was coming out of a rock unprovoked. Radioactive decay. But how could a seemingly inert object like a rock give off energy? Where is it getting that energy from? It was a mystery that seemed to violate the law of conservation of energy. That is, until Einstein published his famous E equals mc squared, which suggested a source of energy for the radiation might be the mass of the nucleus. Just a What's interesting about E equals mc squared is that's what's actually used in nuclear power plants every day, or I guess you could say E equals delta mc squared, or the change in mc squared you get from fission. You got mc on one side being the neutron colliding with the uranium nucleus, and then on the other side you got the fission fragments and a bunch of energy, um, 200 million electron volts per individual fission to give you a sense of scale. Most chemical reactions that you would see like an internal combustion engine in your car or from burning coal in a coal power plant or on the order of tens to hundreds of electron volts, not millions of electron volts. Tiny bit of mass can give you a lot of energy. And this premise was enough for science fiction writers to let their imaginations run wild. <laughs> like H.G. Wells, who in 1914 published the book, The World Set Free, which includes the first mention of the words atomic bomb. He envisioned a uranium based hand grenade that would continue to explode indefinitely. But to scientists, <laughs> that's so cool. I like it when sci-fi can be a bit ahead of uh, 
reality. <laughs> and then we make the sci-fi happen. Kind of like some of those people that claim that Star Trek is responsible for like a lot of technology comes from Star Trek, like like uh, Zoom calls come from like those big uh, screens you see on them, even though a lot of the technology was already in the process of being developed. It's, it's funny to see these get interwoven. This was completely detached from reality. As Einstein in 1933 put it, there is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. It would mean that the atom would have to be shattered at will. And that's just the thing. It is. People had no ability to make a <laughs> nucleus do anything. All we were observing was the natural process of radioactive decay. Atoms of a particular unstable isotope decaying at random with some characteristic half-life. And the energy given off, although immense on the scale of an atom, is pretty insignificant on the scale of people and the world. The fission of a single uranium atom releases 20 times less energy than the amount required to raise a grain of sand the thickness of a piece of paper. But if you think about how small the uranium atom is relative to a piece of paper is massive. Massive compared to just one little uranium atom. Piece of paper on the order of 10 to the minus 6 meters and the nucleus, not the, the atom, this is coming from the nucleus rather than the atom on the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters. But they didn't, I see what they're saying, they didn't anticipate the, um, a sustainable chain reaction of these things. Now, up until 1932, the only known particle in the nucleus was the proton. So if you wanted to alter a nucleus, you could conceivably fire a proton That's at wacky. it. That's wacky. But since the nucleus and the proton are both positively charged, they repel. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to fire the proton in with such high speed and accuracy to get it to hit and stick to a target. And even then, if you're successful, you've only affected one nucleus, which at best can't even lift a grain of sand. So you can see why the Nobel Prize winners were saying, nuclear weapons, not gonna happen. But then comes the discovery of the neutron, and the neutron changes everything, because as an uncharged nuclear particle, it can drift ghostly, undeflected through matter until it hits a nucleus, transforming it into something else. The funny thing, I, I love his mention of discovery of the neutron. It really was like finding the unobtainium or the element zero from Mass Effect that enables you to do magical fun stuff with the atoms, and that's what we use. We use neutrons to split atoms and make safe, clean, reliable nuclear power. And this leads to the epiphany of a man named Leo Zillard. Now, Zillard read the world set free, so he's already imagined a future in which nuclear energy is harnessed by weaponry. And he remembers the exact moment he harnessed comes up weaponry. with this idea as he's crossing the street in London. He says, it suddenly occurred to me that if we could find an element which is split by neutrons and which would emit two neutrons when it absorbed one neutron, then such an element, if assembled in sufficiently large mass, could sustain a nuclear chain reaction. It actually does a little more than that. For uranium-235, it's on the order of 2.6 neutrons per fission. Now that's just emission. Um, the neutron can go to many, many other places other than hitting another uranium nucleus, but the fact that the number is 2, greater than 2, means it can be controlled, that you can keep it as, as a one-to-one -one stable thing. And by the way, that's what critical really means. Number of neutrons in equals number of neutrons out. Reactor is stable and reactor is on. In other words, the neutron enables us to trigger nuclear reactions at will. And if there's a nucleus which, when it splits in this way, releases two neutrons, it could trigger more and more fissions mm -hmm. at an exponentially increasing rate. The nucleus that has this property is uranium-235. In fact, on average, it releases two and a half neutrons every time it go. divides. Now, all of a sudden, you have the possibility of splitting zillions of nuclei simultaneously, releasing incredible <laughs> amounts of energy all at once. That's an atomic bomb. Now, if you want more control over this release of energy, as in a nuclear power plant, well, then you have to absorb a few neutrons so that the fission of one nucleus only causes the fission of one other nucleus on average. Then you have a steady chain reaction that emits the same amount of energy each instant. The challenge is that this is like balancing on a knife edge. Absorb too many neutrons and the chain reaction quickly decays to nothing. Absorb too few and the rate of reactions increases exponentially and soon you're back to a bomb or Chernobyl. So if not for the ex <laughs> that's that's the key point. And here we are given the difference between prompt neutrons versus delayed neutrons. Prompt neutrons, at least 
released almost instantaneously, like 10 to the minus 15 to like 10 to the minus 9 seconds. And prompt neutrons are essential to the operation of a bomb because they enable that rapid multiplication to give you such a violent and destructive explosion. That's the scary one when people say critical. They really mean prompt critical. That's the one where you have rapid reactions. That was also the case in Chernobyl due to a long series of instabilities and poor decisions they made their reactor go prompt critical. I'll pin a comment down below linking a much more lengthy multi-part discussion as I react to HBO's Chernobyl series if you want to hear me talk more about that concept. Nuclear reactors, power plants, nuclear power plants are delayed critical or just critical. So the prompt neutrons only count for part of the chain reaction. A big part, over 90% of it, but that razor's edge, that knife's edge he's talking about is the delayed neutrons. And they're released on the order of several seconds after the fact much easier to control, and that's when you have time to have the absorbers, the control rods, the boric acid in the case of a pressurized water reactor, basically just think of it as liquid control rods, means to slow down the nuclear reaction so it exponentially increases and then safely coasts down when, when it hits equilibrium. There are actually natural um, things that do that as well, such as the act of the water molecules becoming more further apart will actually slow the nuclear chain reaction, causing it to reach a stable equilibrium. Since of the neutron, a neutral nuclear particle to trigger reactions that occurs neutral in greater nuclear, numbers relative to fast. protons in the larger nuclei, meaning they're likely to be given off when a large nucleus splits, well then maybe, as many brilliant scientists suspected, it would be impossible to harness the energy in the nucleus. But as it is in our universe, the neutron is the hero or the villain of nuclear physics. He's the hero. If people want to be the villain, the potential for villainy exists, but he's the, he's the superpower. Just like any other tool, any other innovation that humanity has done, there is that potential to use it for evil. But I'm all for the team of using it, produce, safe, clean, reliable energy. I really liked this one. It's always, I see it as a bit of a motivational factor and very uplifting that these brilliant scientists such as Einstein and Lord Kelvin thought that something was impossible just as we're on the verge of such a major discovery or such a major innovation. That is, if that's not motivation out there, I don't know what is. I, I love watching these types of videos. How do you feel when someone of great authority and respect um, says something's impossible? Let me know. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.